Good evening. It's a great honour to be here in this amazing building. Uh, I was astounded when I walked in here. I had no idea. Uh, I see my mission as uh, the design in residence uh, at the engineering faculty to transform science, technology and engineering into user experience, consumer lifestyle and social culture. Much of my current focus uh, is on the emotional engagement of robotics and I'm just going to give you a few examples. Ten years ago, the smartphone did not exist. So in ten years' time, will, sleek robot, will a sleek robot be the lifestyle have to have? The promise of robots has been with us for hundreds of years, um, all my life. However, even with today's rate of exponential technological change, it does not look as if a convincing humanoid robot experience like this will be with us soon. Well, not in my lifetime. Why? Well, roughly during the day, the human brain issues 20 billion gigaflops of instructions. To put it into context, a computer using conventional processors um, to do this sort of thing would need to be the size of a cruise liner. It would need uh, size will be to power it and it certainly would need the sea to cool it. So yes, a human brain is half a billion times more powerful than uh, a PC, but the gap is closing. And who knows what new technologies are on the horizon. But we are getting to the point where we can't get much smaller than an atom. Now, the in the 19th century, Made in Sheffield was a trusted brand. A bit like Intel inside is a trusted brand for a computer today. Sheffield's reputation as a workshop to the world was forged by the rapid change in manufacturing technologies known as the Industrial Revolution. However, it was also thoughtful design that made this cultural metamorphosis such a global success. One of the biggest technology uh, changes was invented by uh, Sir Henry Bessemer. Uh, who established Sheffield as a major industrial centre. His Bessemer converter process would become the most important technique for making steel in the 19th and 20th century. How it worked is that we knew that if you had a precise carbon content to steel, uh, it would be critical to its strength. But it was always difficult to know how much carbon to add to the iron to make it the, 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 the right strength. So Bessemer's brilliance, his uh, you know, eureka moment, was to burn off all the c carbon in his uh, converter here by blowing air through and then add a set amount, a uh, percentage of uh, 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 carbon later so he could control the percentage. Now Sheffield is again responding with another uh, revolution, with the ad advent of digital manufacturing and robotics, where the dirty, dull, demeaning and dangerous jobs, once carried out by brawny men, are being replaced by slightly leaner folk, where tasks and roles are defined by agile brains, not gender. Yorkshire designer Christopher Dresser was sort of the godfather of modern designers. Uh, his enlightenment occurred as a result of being sent to Japan by the V&A. On his return, he worked as a design consultant to many Sheffield firms, producing what was, even today, incredibly sophisticated and futuristic designs. Uh, this teapot here is still in production um, by Alessi in Italy, completely unchanged. 
His designs were made by several manufacturers, but uh, James Dixon and Sons uh, was, uh, works uh, the most sought after as antiques. The v &A has a fine collection of uh, Christopher Dresser artifacts. And, you know, it's quite interesting when you see uh, the Bauhaus uh, producing uh, this iconic teapot 45 years later, and it was <laughs> considered terribly revolutionary and modern. And as you can see, it slightly resembles the Christopher Dresser. Um, and this one is in the Museum of Modern Art. And about the same time, a young photographer called Walter Zapp, based in Riga, Latvia, was working on a, the design of a groundbreaking Minox sub-miniature camera, as seen in many sp sp spy films. <laughs> Um, it also established a visual cohesive language to products which survives almost as long as its creator. I mean, he died at 98, goodness me. Um, and uh, when you look at the, uh, the products coming out of Apple, uh, in, uh, designed in California by an Englishman trade in Newcastle um, and manufactured in China, uh, I mean, it's, you know, as I said, it's not years, uh, 10 years old, but this epochal pocket device is a combination of many modern inventions, including the phone, the radio, the camera, the computer, GPS map, speedometer, barometer, TV, calculator, word processor, post office, dictaphone, voice control, and many others I can't think of just like that. Um, it is probably the biggest cultural impact um, in the last 600 years since the invention of movable type uh, printing press by Johannes Gutenberg. Um, so, you know, how is it that Apple comes up with these products and what is it um, that makes them stand out? And with a lot of these things, it's down to one person, one personality. Um, and the sadly late Steve Jobs, whose mission it was to bring uh, science and culture together, or technology and the liberal arts, as he put it. And this is pivotal to Apple's success as a design and engineering development company. Now, Apple's products are uh, made in China, and a lot of the products I design are made in China. Um, here's some examples of uh, some products I designed for Sainsbury's to launch their home stores. And during the time I'm designing these, I visit lots of factories. And um, this is pretty much what a factory in Southeast Asia looks like. Um, and, uh, you know, its conditions aren't that different from what it was like visiting Birmingham in the early 80s, when I was uh, started off as a designer. And, um, but, you know, the reason why uh, our manufacturing has moved offshore is much more da down to, you know, I mean, in the early 80s, uh, companies like Marks and Spencer's Mothercare used to boast that their goods were 95% made in the UK. Since then, uh, containerization has reduced shipping costs by more than 90%. Uh, the fall of Mao has meant that Chinese factories soon learned how to make things cheaply and well. And then to cap it all, along came uh, modern communications with the fax, and then email and Skype, which makes this process much, much easier, being able to communicate across. And, I can send digital files back and forth to Japan, and um, it's actually quite convenient because I'll work on my designs during the day, send them off in the evening. They wake up just as I'm sending them off. They work on them all day, and they send a reply back. And it, in some ways, it works very well. There are quite a lot of things that get lost in translation. Um, but it's... Um, Although it didn't really kick off until the 70s, it's quite interesting that 
intermodal freight, which is what they call the shipping container, is actually something that you can load up in a uh, outside a factory, take on the back of a truck, put on the back of a um, uh, a train, then put on the back of, of a ship, take it all the way to the Suez Canal, where it gets put on a train, uh, taken to the other side of America, then put on a boat again, and then comes over to us. Um, and, you know, doing that in the old days would have just been pretty much impossible. So that, it's really more down to, down to that than anything else, um, is my view. Um, 35 years ago, uh, I started at Mother Care, and there was no visual cohesiveness to the store at all. Um, practically everything was um, bought by females, and uh, the only things that weren't were the push chairs, which were bought by men. They had wheels on them, um, and uh, they were pretty medieval by today's standards. The manufacturer just invested a million pounds in a steel chroming plant, and I came along and I said, well, actually, I want to make these out of polymers and advanced modern materials. And he looked at me as if he was, I was mad and said, oh, plastics, all right for toys, but, you know, push shows. So, to prove my point, I bought a ski boot to the next meeting and said, look, this is what I mean by polymers, and I think we should be making push sheds out of this material. And uh, he took it on board, and uh, we did investigate it, and we developed a uh, push share, which we called the Via. And it was amazingly successful. I mean, it was, I was, there were pictures of me in the window of Mother Care with this thing I'd just designed, and I felt like a real hero. It was my first taste of success. And, um, you know, when you look at it, um, why it was successful, it wasn't just that we'd uh, looked at um, uh, polymers and things like that, is that we had made a lot of effort to go out and ask customers um, what they wanted, what their dreams were and we had observed how they push shares were used and we had arrived at an understanding what the benchmark you know that a you know how light it needed to do and it needed to go back in in the back of a mini metro and it needed to be able to take a child straight from hospital and the child had to look at the mother or the the the, the, the carer or whatever they call them these days uh, and um, then look out to the outside world and, hey, it could stand up while you're standing at a bus stop or it could fit in the back of the mini metro. Um, so that was fantastic and it gave me the confidence and the um, ability to, and the reputation to start my own business. Um, all the time since then, I've dreamed of designing a wheelchair. And uh, I've recently started working with the uh, University of uh, Sheffield, uh, working on the control mechanisms and, and things like that. Um, we've got a smart wheelchair that we're working on that will go up and down uh, so that you, can, uh, you don't have to convert your kitchen or your sink uh, in your bathroom, uh, and even when you're meeting people, you can look at them in the eye. It moves sideways and it swivels, um, and it can go down very narrow corridors and around very tight bends. And so what we are, we're in a, when we're looking at developing products, we have what we call the innovation journey which vaguely looks like a tube map, but uh, actually these are what we call work packages. So work package one is scoping in research, really understanding how, what the problems are and what the challenges are and what could be done, what the opportunities are. Then agreeing a brief, taking all that understanding and agreeing what we're gonna do. Then come up with ideas and you know, as far as I'm concerned, creativity comes from everyone. You know, if whoever we're talking to has an idea, it should be evaluated. It's not the, you know, 
the uh, monopoly of so-called creative industries or designers or things like that. Then we get to the development stage where we take the ideas and we make them work and we test them and we uh, validate them and we get certification from them and then we implement it, which means put it into the production and um, selling it. Um, usually I get about 18 months to do this, if I'm lucky. A lot of the time these days people want me to do it in nine months. And if I talk to um, a lot of academics and I say I'm going to do all this in nine months, they think I'm, I'm mad, you know. But I mean, the reality is that, um, you know, academic research can be iterative and circular, but we need to meet commercial development schedules and time is very linear indeed. But the key to all of this and developing products is collaboration and to get people collaborating at every stage of the innovation journey. So here you've got the, the first stage, which is research-led and marketing-led, and you've got that, um, the, the most input there. Then you get onto the ideas stage, and then that tends to be design-led, and the development tends to be design-led. And then um, it goes on to be technically led, in other words, manufacturing led. But even at the last stage, when things are being sold in the shops, the designers have always got to think, how could that product be better? And so that's something that we're always thinking about. Um, it's an interesting thing, you know, to look um, uh, at it, you know, it's the designers that are creating the, and the technicians that are creating the real value. But, you know, there's barely 3% of the growth, uh, uh, of the gross retail spent on this activity, which is not a great incentive. And, um, you know, it's perhaps the reason why that, you know, designers aren't as wealthy as Sir Philip Green, but there we are. Um, this is an example of something I didn't design, uh, a client came to me and said, uh, we've got this cup, it's got a great idea, a non-spill uh, uh, lid. We went to a design company, they've designed it, and it's too expensive and it leaks out of the edge, what can you do? So I had remembered that Earl Tupper had uh, patented Tupperware on the basis of polypropylene and polyethylene making a very good seal. And polypropylene and polyethylene are very inexpensive materials compared to the ABS and polycarbonate that the previous design used. So uh, we were able to actually cut the manufacturing costs and uh, improve reliability and performance, Go, um, have an appearance which was a little less generic than the previous one, and the sales were fantastic. And in fact, 30 million have been made in Wales. And people just assume it's, oh, that must be made in China. It's plastic, therefore it must be made in China. Not necessarily the case. And sometimes um, it's very simple ideas, which are why has nobody ever thought of that? A, a cafetiere inside a mug um, that sells really well. And it's got many, many loyal uh, customers, uh, including this baddie from Avatar. And uh, I was sort of looking at that, oh, watching the film, oh my goodness, it's one of my mugs. But this is what's really important. Far more important than getting design awards is getting sales and satisfying your customer. And that has got to always be in your mind when you're a designer, you know, it is all about satisfying the customer, providing a, an experience that the customer is going to enjoy. And working often on an emotional uh, level and instilling objects with emotional appeal, elegance, charm, wit often, um, and simple and effective design. I worked with Nigella Lawson, which was great fun, I have to say. You know, having someone who, uh, you know, uh, 
says, you know, that your job here, Sebastian, is to maximize my brand assets. And um, one of the things we tried to do was also um, uh, build in functional innovation as a key driver. Um, the best uh, designs are often obvious after the event, um, but before, you know, simplicity can be incredibly difficult to achieve. Uh, this is a very traditional format of a kitchen scales, but restyled. And it, this is just superficial styling. Um, and uh, it sold it incredibly well. And the um, uh, John Lewis kitchen buyer said, why, why do your scales sell so well? You know, digital scales are much better. And I said, well, you know, it's a brilliant design, isn't it? Um, but I did stand in the corner of a shop watching the display of my scales and it was quite interesting because people came up and they pick up the weights which had been inspired by pebbles off the beach and they pick them up and they would sort of hold them and you could see a little switch going off in their heads you know a buy me switch and it was just quite simple uh, that that was it now this is a tool bag and it costs 1600 pounds and uh, it sells incredibly well. And you think, who would buy a 1,600 pound tool bag? Well, it's because the shop we designed it for uh, also sells 3,000 pounds of handbags. And they don't have anything in them, you know? And so it's really a case of the value tier and where you sell them to and who you're selling them to and things like that. I'll give you an example. Now, here's some very simple stoneware storage jars. See them in Selfridges? How much would you expect to pay for them? You know, 25 pounds? Yeah, you've never been to Selfridges. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe John Lewis, 10, yeah? Same storage jars. Ikea, maybe three pounds, you know, and it's, a lot of it is because Ikea makes things by the million. And uh, you've got to amortize, uh, you know, you've got to spread the cost of manufacturing and all the development costs um, over a million, whereas John Lewis will probably only sell a couple of a thousand or something like that. So that's why, places like IKEA are able to uh, um, uh, create such good value. So how do we design things that people want to buy? How do we create itchy wallet, as we call it? Uh, it's all about really creating value, and value is a perception. And it's a perception, I believe, uh, made up of the brand, the design, and the quality, uh, divided by the cost. So brand is totally about perception. It's an idea that people have in their minds, an expectation of behavior. And then you look at design, and there are two aspects of design. There's emotional design and there's rational design. Let me explain. So emotional design is actually creating the personality for objects. And uh, you know it works on the aesthetics, uh, how they relate to fashion. I mean, Josiah Wedgwood said that often fashion is far more significant than merit. Now, that would be the last thing I'd expect him to say. But if you think about it, what he's saying is if you're not selling what people want to buy, you're stuffed. Well, he wouldn't have said that, but you know. Um, and then uh, we look at rational design, and here we're talking about the functional behavior of objects and uh, how, they, how well they do their task, how easy they are to use, um, you know, their inventiveness, as it were. And uh, then finally, we're talking about manufacturing uh, because that's what quality is all about. Now, if I really, really understand how something is going to be made, I can d design it so it's easier to make. You know, I mean, think of that anyway up cup I showed you. You know, it's just the knowledge of the materials and it 
just happened that I'd read that story about Earl Tupper that informed me about the right polymers to use. And this also covers the, the uh, service aspect. So if I understand how something can be made or could be made, I can design it in a way that um, it uh, is straightforward to make. If it's straightforward to make, it's going to cost less and it's going to fail less and uh, it will do the job better. And, you know, what we're talking about is um, the uh, value and brand are very intangible things and they exist often in the mind of the consumer and it's very difficult to sell intangible things to people or discuss it round a table because you sit round a table with a bunch of engineers and you start talking about the intangibles of aesthetics. They have, you know, less than flattering views of uh, your masculinity and things like that. But uh, when we're talking about cost is, I should point out that cost isn't just about the money, it's the social cost, uh, the environmental cost, um, and it's convenience. You know, I buy stuff on Amazon all the time, not because of the price, because I don't have the time to go to the shop and I need stuff. And it gives me more time if I just buy it online. Um, so what it comes down to is, if you take this, it comes down to subconscious decisions uh, that you're ma making with your inner brain and your animal brain, and then conscious decisions in blue that you're making with your sapient brain and your sort of human brain, as it were. So that's um, that. Now. We talked about designing, um, this is a 3D printer we, we've designed and we're trying to make it so it's suitable for use for children. And we've been, um, and what people don't understand about 3D printing, and they hear the words 3D printing, and there's lots of different types of 3D printing. Uh, you know, this 3D printing is to mathematics what multiplication or addition is. Uh, whereas the 3D printing that went to make this cycle helmet is more at the calculus end of uh, mathematics and is uh, a, a lot more uh, sophisticated. And so we've been working with the um, additive manufacturing um, uh, department at, at Sheffield on a number of uh, sports-related additive manufacturing products. This is a cycle helmet. Um, it is custom-made, so you get your head scanned so it fits you like a handmade shoe, but actually it's much cheaper and more comfortable. And it's got much better ventilation and the lightweight cellular construction absorbs impa impact and provides unrivaled ve ventilation. And it's, as I say, surprisingly comfortable. Then we get feedback from orthopedic surgeons who deal with professional cyclists saying that they're suffering from a lot of hip injuries and um, especially as people uh, cycle later and older and all that sort of thing. So uh, what we're looking at is to design a cycle saddle that actually doesn't force the hips apart, but actually brings them together. So we've come up with this one that surrounds the buttocks and releases pressure on the hips. It increases rider comfort the saddle flexes with the rider movement and we've been able to integrate other, other things in there. And you can have it sort of custom made for you, but actually 3D printing is a very good uh, method of, of making this. And uh, the riders we've been testing, the professional riders we've been testing it with, actually feels that um, it, it allows them to put more power into their legs rather than t using their muscles to keep their legs together. So they feel that it's actually giving them a, 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 a performance advantage. We've also designed a, um, a rainy day bike, a training bike. Um, and um, so talking of rainy days, uh, how are we going to cope with the inevitable onset of age? Um, now, Current care models aren't going to meet the demands that aging people in the future. We've got a perfect storm of longer lives, baby boomers, 
the cost of health care, changing aspirations, and there are more and more people to deal with demanding more for less budget. I've chosen uh, these uh, pop stars because, of course, they're, uh, um, they're people that thought they'd never get old. Um, and um, the thing is that you know, Mick Jagger and the, all the Rolling Stones were born during the war. They're sort of D-Day babies. And then, you know, I was born, you know, just as rationing ended. And um, uh, then, you know, these, these other guys that people look, look up to. And we've had a completely different experience from the make do amenders that are in old people's homes at the moment. Uh, we've been born into the welfare model. Uh, we are, you know, the age of entitlement. Uh, and uh, we also have different attitudes to, well, pretty much everything compared to those that have gone before us. Then we look at uh, working with uh, the University of uh, Sheffield's Centre for Assistive Technology and Connected Healthcare, CATCH, uh, and their experts cite there's 36 key reasons why people get put into residential home uh, care. And we feel that we can use assistive technologies to help with about 21 of these key triggers, uh, mitigating the reasons to go into care. Now, the reason why we don't want people to go into care is uh, it's uh, more, more expensive than people looking after themselves at home. Uh, but the key reason <laughs> and this is something that people quite often forget, is that people are much happier and they have better quality of life if they're li living at home and in an air with people they're familiar with. And, they, and uh, when people go into that sort of, you know, corporate donkey sanctuary that they call care homes, uh, they, uh, you know, they, I mean, they, it's not very enjoyable. I mean, they're, 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 they're well-meaning people who make it as nice as possible, but uh, I've seen, heard some terrible anecdotes. I won't go any further on that. Um, so what we've do, do, done is we are d developing something that we call the Carefree Home System with the University of Sheffield, and this actually is combining the robotics with the assistive uh, healthcare, which we call the Carefree Home System. And we're focusing on well-being, safety, isolation, mobility. And so this um, ecosystem is designed to help older people take care of themselves and live independently. Uh, it's got five components, which I've named A, B, C, D, E. There's the assistant, which uh, is a self-navigating autonomous table that can move around your uh, home, uh, it can go over your bed, uh, it can assist in various roles, uh, carrying things from room to room, uh, as an eating surface or a working surface, and as a stability aid. Uh, we can actually uh, put a screen, a telescreen on it, so it can also act as a communication tool. Um, and we can have a hand on it so it can stretch down and pick up your glasses or do very lightweight tasks. The problem is that a hand and, a hand and an arm, the technology hasn't arrived yet. It's over the horizon. We know it's not far over the horizon, but you know, it all depends on the type of sensors we're going to use. And it's not like oh, well, I've seen arms and hands, yeah, but they cost £100,000. And we need to be able to make an arm and a hand for £500. And so it's a question of that coming along. Then there's the, the bracelet. This is a vital signs communicator. Uh, it can sense um, body temperature, movement, pulse, and it's got an automatic uh, fall detection. That you tug the band for an alarm and you slap it if you want to ca cancel the alarm. And uh, you can also use it to work with the other devices. 
and it's got a beacon that helps people know where you are. It can learn your daily routine and check for abnormalities, um, and it works with a regular smartphone if you leave the house, um, so if you've got one in your uh, pocket or handbag. Uh, then uh, there's a pet, and as I said earlier, you know, designing a humanoid is going to be a long way away, but actually, if I have a pet that will obey 10 voice commands, it's seen to be as quite a clever pet, you know, and is reasonably obedient. Uh, if, in addition, that pet can respond back to me verbally, discuss the weather, TV listings, the news, find my glasses, keys, wallet, remote control, it actually becomes rather more useful than a conventional pet combined with Radio 4. Um, but yet, wait, we can also make this pet Monitor, help this pet monitor your health, remind you to take your pills, and it can call for health, help, and much more. And this is something that we can definitely achieve with Near Horizon Technologies. In fact, we are just manufacturing a short production run of Miro Beta. This is called Miro, by the way, in case you hadn't realised. Uh, which um, includes a, the Sheffield um, uh, developed 3B operating system, which stands for brain-based biomimetic software. And so rather than going the conventional artificial intelligence route, uh, what they've done at Sheffield is they've reverse engineered the brain or reverse engineered uh, nature, as it were. So uh, it's actually looking at technologies from nature's point of view rather than a man's point of view. Um, so uh, this um, is our companion and it's designed so it can outperform a conventional pet in many ways. And here he is and he's charging himself in his uh, little uh, thing there and uh, we've got lots and lots of these. And what is very strange is that they can learn and they seem to be attracted to each other. And this is not something that we've designed into the software at all, but they have this sort of mutual uh, attraction and, you know, and they, can, uh, they will be able to soon uh, recognise your uh, facial expressions and be what we call quasi-sentient and understand people's moods and uh, needs and wants. And then finally, we have what we call the multi-purpose environmental sensor, which goes on the ceiling. It replaces your smoke detector. Uh, it can hear call, calls, distress calls. Uh, it can recognise familiar pet, uh, faces. It senses all activity in rooms and uh, provides CCTV instrument in intruder detection with face recognition and a sort of rewind of my life facility where, you know, if you've forgotten what happened, you can, or if there's been an issue, it can uh, deal with it. Uh, it can also measure air quality and uh, other, other things. Now, you know, this is all beginning to sound a bit like something that George Orwell was writing about in 1984. Um, and, you know, what we don't want is to feel that people to feel that, oh, we've just left a whole load of robots to look after granny. And uh, this is not the thought at all. Is, this is additional to normal care, additional to telepresence. And, you know, so this, these devices will be around when people are, are alone. Um, and then we've got something called the, the data hub which acts as a, connects all these devices together. Because a lot of the time you need actually quite a lot of processing power to run these devices, like with that, that cruise liner. Um, so what we do is we get it to offload the processing to a large uh, uh, hub in the home. It's a bit like when you're using Siri, your smartphone can't, understand what you're saying at all. No, it just relays what you're saying to a giant computer off in Sacramento or somewhere, 
and uh, then that will come back and that will interpret what you said and uh, get, get back to you. So what we've got is a, we're using the data hub as a, a firewall, um, a sort of encrypted firewall, so that not too much, you know, pictures of, you know, grandpa in his underwear don't get onto YouTube is basically very important. And that all the private information is actually kept in the little ecosystem and then when it needs to find information outside, like what the weather's going to be, what's on TV, uh, or if you want to use it to contact uh, uh, friends and family, it can do that. But in the case of an accident, um, and what you've got to remember, number one on the uh, uh, list of reasons why people go into care is fear of falling. It's not actually falling, is that they fear they're going to fall. And you know, they, I went to see my dad the other day and he's got a black eye and it's like, oh, you know, and he's, he's had a fall, but you know, he's, he's, oh, I just woke up with it, you know. Um, but uh, so the e-sensor will notice the fall, the bracelet might detect the fall, the companion might arrive on the scene and interpret what's going on and speak uh, and if there's no response, it might open up the privacy and it will say that your privacy is being uh, invaded here um, and, you know, slap your wrist if, if you, you don't want anything to happen. And if you don't slap your wrist, it goes through to a, um, uh, a, a carer where your vital signs are set through. They can see what the condition is now. They can rewind and find out what happened just before this, and so when the uh, ambulance or whatever is coming, they know what to expect and things like that. Um, and so we need to build this into our homes and we need to design homes for people to grow old in, because a lot of the time, the, 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 the home that you bought for your family and to bring, it, bring up your family is uh, not really suitable uh, for uh, later life and so what we're trying to do is think about what uh, homes would be appropriate for people in later life where they would enjoy being and uh, so there can be some element of downsize and upgrade. I mean think of it more as selling the family Volvo when the children have left and buying a Mini Cooper. Um, as a, you know, something smaller and sportier and better and uh, more engaged. And this is something that we need to think about. I mean, we're, we're not doing this, but we see that this is the sort of vaguely the vision we have of where the future will be, uh, go. Another key reason why people can't look after themselves is that they can't cook for themselves. Um, so we've been working on this demonstration prototype um, and uh, it's just cooked a lobster beast, by the way, uh, speed it up. Uh, and uh, you look at this here and you think, oh, well, this is uh, the kitchen of the future. And uh, yeah, our target price for this is probably going to start at £100,000 in five years time. Five years after that, it will have gone down to probably about £10,000 and then it will start to approach the price of what you expect a dishwasher to be. Um, and uh, so in 20 years time, these will be a sort of dishwasher type price. Um, so there we are. Um, the best thing is that it cleans up after itself, if you ask me. Anyway, so that's what I call the Concord of Science and Culture. And uh, we've got seven more minutes for questions, if anyone wants to ask me something. <laughs>